Hey guys and shine, and welcome to the I Give a Damn podcast, brought to you by Floracy Media, the same company behind ODs on Facebook. Now, before we dive in, I do want to take a moment to talk about an incredible product from today's sponsor, Performance Vision Technologies, introducing the Altius Performance Tinted Contact Lenses. If you have not heard or seen of Altius contact lenses yet, Altius are soft, single-use, daily disposable contacts that feature their own patent-pending technology. They are built on over 25 years of university-based research and are the only FDA-cleared contact lens to enhance clarity and contrast compared to the unaided human eye. Available right now in two tints, both gray-green and amber. One unique feature about the Altius gray green lenses is that case reports are showing remarkable improvements in symptoms for patients who suffer with migraines. With these case reports reporting an 80% decrease in light sensitivity during the migraine, as well as an 84% increase in the patient's ability to use electronic screens during their attack. Moreover, these lenses have been reported to improve social engagement for patients with migraines, as these case reports have shown an 84% increase in the ability of the patients to engage in social interactions during their migraine episodes. The Altius lenses also feature an industry-leading 100% UV light blockage, as well as blocking up to 99% of blue light. And with the contact lens design offering 360-degree immersion, it eliminates any sort of the peripheral light leakage that you frequently experience with spectacle-mounted tints, further reducing any visual stress. Altius lenses are available through ABB Optical and come in both Plano as well as coming in powers of minus 50 all the way up to minus 6 in quarter diopter steps. So if your patient is looking for a solution to their migraine related light sensitivity or to enhance their visual performance and comfort, I would look into Altius Performance Tinted Contact Lenses. Otherwise, thank you to Performance Vision Technology for sponsoring this episode and let's get into it. Today we are joined by Dr. Jacqueline Thies, who is a master in neurooptometry. And today she not only shares her personal journey of how she found her subspecialty, but she shares some clinical tips and insights into how the everyday practitioner can help identify, treat, and refer these special cases of head injury, concussion, and the like. So. Again, without further ado, please hit those like and subscribe buttons and join me in this amazing conversation with Dr. Jacqueline Thies. So just to start off for all of our viewers, listeners, for people who've clicked on this, uh, fill us in on where do you practice and what do you do? So currently I practice in Richmond, Virginia. I have my own private practice called Virginia Neuro Optometry, and it's located at a multidisciplinary brain injury center, so the Concussion Care Center of Virginia. Uh, we have an inpatient outpatient center, and I get the luxury of working with brain injury medicine physiatrists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, so it's this wonderful group place. Um, where a patient can come and really get all aspects of their brain injury care in one place. And, and the nice thing is we can also talk to each other about the care and how we can streamline the care, um, which is amazing. Because oftentimes when you've had a brain injury, you're in multiple rehabs and your life becomes rehab. Uh, so it's wonderful to just go to one place, get them all done in one day and then live your life. Uh, so obviously that gives away that I practice neurooptometry, uh, and that is essentially looking at patients who have vision problems with brain injury or other neurologic disorders uh, or neurodevelopmental disorders. So I also work with a lot of kids who have autism or cerebral palsy or ADHD, and we look at what visual problems are barriers to the things you want to see and do in your life mm -hmm. and how can we fix them. I think a lot of people when they think neurooptometry, they immediately think vision therapy. Um, and vision therapy is one of the tools that I definitely use if they have an eye movement problem. But a lot of it is also eye health, right? And so we know that dry eye is prominent in patients with neurologic conditions mm -hmm. and it behaves differently um, in neurologic patients because it's not necessarily inflammatory. It's more due to a neurologic problem innervating how the eye works, blinks, lac how the lacrimal gland works. So it's a comprehensive eye health examination from a neurologic perspective. That's uh, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> uh, so we will. I do. I do have a lot of questions about that. But just just uh, kind of even wind it back. How did you find yourself? Of all the different subspecialties, what drew you to neuro to begin with? I went into optometry for neuro. Um, I was that 
athlete that was a 2010 athlete. I never needed glasses, never needed contacts. And I suffered a bunch of concussions when I was younger and just couldn't read. Um, and I would get headaches within five minutes of reading. And of course, all of the neurologists I would see would just send me to an ophthalmologist and the ophthalmologist would say I was perfect because I had great vision. And to him, vision was just 2010. And um, they just said, kind of wait it out, it'll get better. Uh, and after six years of waiting it out and it not getting better, I went to college. I was pre-med and at my college, they make you go to other subspecialists um, within healthcare to make sure you really, if you're gonna take the Adam cat, you better make sure you wanna go to med school. Um, and so they make you, you know, look at dentistry, look at optometry, look at other fields. And I was following an optometrist and she did an eye exam on me. And it was the first time I'd had an eye exam with an optometrist, which was a different experience than ophthalmology. And she did one eye movement test and said, how do you read? And I was just like, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, yeah, I can tell. And she gave me prism glasses and I went from reading for five minutes to an hour. And I was first and foremost, absolutely infuriated that nobody had sent me to an optometrist. And then that opened my eyes to, there are optometrists that work with patients, specifically with brain injury at that time. Gosh, this was over, what, 20 years ago. Um, at that time, that was hard to find. Um, but I knew it was there. And so that's when I decided I want to do this. I want to just work with patients who have brain injury and I want to do concussion specifically. But once I actually got into it, I realized it's this whole wide mecca of patients not getting right care. Uh, I looked for an optometry school that specialized in neurooptometry. None of them did. Uh, I went to Berkeley. And even when I was a student at Berkeley, and you can ask all the professors there, they were like, what are you going to do? And I'd be like, neuro. And they're like, OK, but what are you actually going to do? Um, and they all told me I couldn't do it. They told me I couldn't make it a specialty. They said I'd never have enough patience to make it a full-time job. Um, and I'm stubborn and I just didn't care. And I was like, you know, and, and especially my contact lens professor always laughs at me to this day. He's come to some of my lectures and he's like, I always laugh because I remember telling you that you couldn't do it and here you are doing it. Um, and so that's been beautiful for me and the fact that I'm really glad I'm stubborn uh, and stuck with it because it's been a huge patient population that nobody treats. And now I get all these students that I get a mentor that want to do the same thing. And it's like something you literally see could have helped you, right? It's something that could have um, impacted and changed your life. So you're like solving that problem. Yeah. And I think it's funny too, because for the first part of my career, I was mentored also by ophthalmology. So after I finished my residency, I did end up working with neuro-ophthalmology for a while. And they all were like, don't tell the patients you've had brain injury. Like, don't tell them that. They're, they're going to think less of you and, and be think that you're weak. Um, you know, don't be personal with them. And it'd be funny because patients are like, man, you just really get it. And I'm like, well, I, I absolutely get it. <laughs> um, and then I think after I kind of grew up a little bit more and matured, I realized patients actually value the fact that I've been through it and they value my story. I think they're more open to telling me some of their symptoms that they're embarrassed to tell other providers because they know I've had a brain injury so I can relate to them in some way. Yeah. So I actually think that even though previous people told me not to do it, I think it's been better to I do think, it. I think it would, wouldn't it give them a lot of hope? Like they see like, hey, my I'm suffering, but my doctor went through things like this and they're awesome. Like I could, like it means I could heal. I could improve. There's yeah. there's hope for me. 100%. So I don't know. That's, that's kind of an interesting story of how that works out. But yeah. With uh, the kind of journey through school and into residency, mm -hmm. right? Where, where did you do your residency? I did my residency at Berkeley. At Berkeley, okay. Yep. And then from there, you taught at Berkeley. Yeah, so during my residency, I did a research project with the sports medicine department at Cal. Uh, and so we were looking at, because their big question, which I think is still a good question, is are the eye movement problems coming from the injury itself? Hmm. Or are they pre-existing problems in a patient base that has good vision and doesn't get an eye exam? And we're just unmasking something that was there before. So I did research project that essentially baselined all of the athletes. And um, when they would get a concussion, I would see them at serial time points after the concussion to see what was the natural history of the eye movement dysfunction. And we learned, A, that a lot of them did have eye movement problems at baseline, but the eye movement problems they acquired from concussion were different from the ones they had at baseline. And that a lot of them got better on their own without intervention, but a small subset didn't and they benefited from rehab. Um, and But the big thing from that research project was I then took that data and convinced the university that this is a problem, not just for our student athletes, but for any student on campus that gets a concussion. The campus is liable to make sure that we fix their vision problems so they can you know, do school. Right. And so from that, they ended up helping me start a clinic. Um, so I did the first sports vision concussion clinic uh, in the country, and it was at the football stadium at Cal. 
That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so from there, like, how did you get into the private practice where you're at now? Yeah, uh, a very long journey. <laughs> so I taught at Cal for a couple of years. The clinic exploded. Uh, we ended up hiring a, multiple providers, which was awesome. And again, it's that thing where it's, it's a huge need no one realizes they need. Um, big resource for the community. And in California, Kaiser Permanente is a very large HMO mm -hmm. um, that works there. And I was working, um, one of my colleagues had just kind of said like, oh, you should moonlight here. Um, and as we all know, when you're young and have a lot of loans, you moonlight anywhere you can. So I started working at Kaiser and I thought I would hate it and I loved it. It was a hospital medicine. Of course, when I started, I was just doing primary optometry, but the ophthalmologist there really embraced how different I was in the sense of how much I love double vision. Apparently ophthalmology hates double vision um, and neuro. And so I had this wonderful opportunity for five years to work in a hospital setting with neuro ophthalmology, oculoplastics, pediatrics, strabismus, surgeons, and getting to do all of their non-surgical work, which really made me an even better clinician and get to see how to medically treat some of these eye problems mm -hmm. versus therapeutically with rehab. And so it was like a nice second residency almost. And then um, the fires happened in California. So when people ask, how did I get from California to Virginia? It was the fires. Uh, I'm a big <laughs> runner and I you can't run outside because of all the soot in the air. And that was my happy place. Um, as we, we've talked earlier, working in brain injury can be really depressing. And there are days where I just need to run it out, you know? And if you can't run because the air quality is so bad, it just really got my mental health. So I was just looking to leave. Mm -hmm. And one of the physical medicine doctors I worked with in California, she introduced me to her colleague and she said, you know, this guy, Nathan Zasler, he wrote the textbook on brain injury medicine. He knows everyone that does brain injury in the world. Like here's his cell phone number, um, which was the scariest cold call I've ever made in my life. And he, within an hour, was like, you know, if you want to set up a practice, um, come to Virginia and I'll sublet you space. You can start your practice. We can work together and work with our patients together. And we created this great multidisciplinary practice. Um, so that's how I transitioned to private practice. And I have no regrets, except I wouldn't recommend cold starting in March of 2020. Timing was not on my side. Yeah, that's a tough, that's such a tough time. <laughs> I have another friend in Minnesota who opened up the rest at that time. And it's... It's like, how? How did you do it? <laughs> but I mean, you do have yeah. a you do have a subspecialty where people really need help. Right. And that's I think my biggest fear, actually, when I first started, aside from the fact was it's a subspecialty, which means I don't do primary care at all, which means people need to know I'm here to refer. That was my first fear. Um, the second one I had was everyone's living inside. No one's playing sports or driving around. Who's going to be getting brain injuries? And that's like a ter terrible thing to say out loud. Like I want people getting brain injuries, but that was a real, like maybe there won't be any patients. And what was sad was I got there and there was just a backlog of patients who had needed these services for years and no one was around to give it to them. So I ended up literally got there and I had a full patient load within about three months. Wow. Why do you think, cause you mentioned like, especially when you went to school, people are like, you'll never have enough patience. This isn't a, a big enough thing. Why do you think, because it seems obvious, you can attest to it, there are a lot of patients yeah. who suffer with this. Mm -hmm. And I feel, at least culturally, especially with like the movie, I forgot, Will Smith's movie about concussions after um, football yeah. injuries, uh, there is a lot more attention coming into migraines, concussion, head injuries, uh, all these neuro aspects. I think it's becoming more popular. Yeah. But why do you think there has been this discrepancy? Maybe it still exists. I think the discrepancy exists, but I think media has helped mm -hmm. um, really bring this to light. And that all actually happened after I'd already gotten into my specialty. So when I first got in there, I think the big misknowledge, I guess, terrible word to say, but is that it's not common right? Oh, concussion is not that common. Concussion gets better in a week. It's, it self-resolves. It's not a big issue. And I think that's a big, it's not just for vision care, but for all of healthcare to recognize that concussions are not a benign event. And that's what we're learning with CTE. Even the subconcussive blows are not necessarily benign events. Not everybody recovers quickly and not everybody recovers. And um, when you don't recover, you end up getting secondary sequelae that can make it worse. Mm -hmm. um, everyone's brain injury is different. And I always say, just look at the numbers. You know, we care so much in our profession. And it's not that I don't care about glaucoma. We care a ton about glaucoma. There's what, 300,000 cases of glaucoma. 
there's a million new concussions every year. There are millions of people suffering from previous concussions. Mm-hmm. It's the numbers game. And then you look at the number of optometrists or and how many ophthalmologists, right, specialize in concussion. It's a handful of us. Um, and so it's, it's a problem that's bigger than our field. And the problem is that of patients, because of the neural network within the brain, of patients who have a concussion, the likelihood that they'll have vision problems is high. And so there's a really big mismatch on providers that are doing the care, patients knowing that there's care to do, um, and where to go. Right. And I just think of young kids. So I know I, as a young kid, I'd fall off the playground, hit my head really hard. Who's to say I didn't get a concussion that went unreported? You know, parents just thought, oh, he'll be fine. Who's to say that my the vision issues I struggled with as a kid, learning to read, focusing, that that wasn't somewhat related? Yeah. Well, and having a pediatric practice is interesting because there will always be, and I have found that in doing both developmental and acquired ocular motor exams, they present differently. Their mm-hmm. symptoms are different and you can kind of tell. So I'll have a little kid and I'll be like, do you ever have a history of you know concussion or brain injury? And they're like, nope. And then you do the exam and you're like, you've definitely had a brain injury <laughs> at some point, right? And, and I mean, to the extent that sometimes I've um, had to reach out to the primary care for concerns of domestic violence, like if they mm-hmm. vehemently de- deny it, um, so. Or there's going to be the kid where the parents are like, no, they've never had a concussion. The kid's like, no, remember that time I beelined it into the dresser, right? Like the kid will remember the event, the parents won't. Um, or, and that happens all the time too. Yeah, the kid maybe didn't want to tell mom and dad because mm-hmm. they didn't want to get in trouble. Yeah, or the athlete that doesn't want to get pulled from play. So they just never say that they had one, even though they've been suffering ever since. Um, and I get I, those star- stories always get me too, is when they all connect the dots of like, Johnny was a good reader until day X. And then all of a sudden he hated reading. Um, and the problem is the symptoms aren't always visual. It's inattention, ADHD-like symptoms, and mm-hmm. it's a visual problem. What uh, you mentioned that detecting developmental challenges with with focus is different than maybe acquired. Mm-hmm. Can you give us maybe some tips, telltale things that you you recognize and look for in the clinic? Yeah. So for me, it's the symptoms, um, symptom provocation with testing. Uh, and when you're working with someone who has a developmental reading problem and you've seen those kids in your clinic, usually it's mom dragging that kid in. The kid doesn't like reading. He's not good at reading. But when you ask him what it's like to read, um, he'll just be like, meh, I don't know. I don't like doing it. You know, it, it, he's very nondescript. When it's brain injury, you often get symptoms provoked by it. You know, I don't like reading because it makes me dizzy. I don't like reading because it makes me nauseous. And when you're doing the testing with these kids, you do one near point of accommodation testing. They're about to throw up in your chair. Whereas with my developmental peds, I can do NPA for 10 minutes. Is it accurate? Is it, you know, does it fatigue? Is it normal? Not necessarily, but they're not going to throw up in my chair. So the level of symptom provocation is very different when it's acquired. Um, Also asymmetry, and so you'll see weird findings, um, and we're starting to publish more about this, is the deficits that you're seeing make no sense. Um, For example, you'll have one eye that's an accommodative spasm and one eye that's accommodative insufficiency. Developmentally, that makes no sense, um, that one eye would do it in that asymmetric way. Mm. It also means that you can't fix it with glasses, right? If we fix insufficiency with plus, but a a spasm doesn't like plus, you're not going to fix that with glasses, so you have to do rehab to actually get it better. And with, so I was going to say, what other, what are ways that you often treat with neuro rehab? Because there's, that's certainly there's, you know, dive into the VT realm or like what, how do you, can you just explain more of how you go about treating patients? So I will say that having worked with physicians changed my perspective on it because how I was taught in school is not how I practice. Mm. So when I was working with athletes, um, I think the way we're always taught is step one, give them glasses, have them wear the glasses for a while and come back. And if that doesn't work, try rehab. Um, and it takes forever to get people better. When I was working in athletics, literally, I just remember our sports med physician was like, glasses are great. They can't wear them on the field. I need you to start rehab tomorrow. And we'll order the glasses, we'll do what you want, but you know, let's get them started on rehab now. Um, And that, I started doing that more just on their direction. And I started recognizing number one, you can definitely start rehab within 72 hours of injury. They get better fast, they get better before their glasses even got back from optical. And I got really into this thing of, yes, glasses can be helpful, but a lot of people don't want glasses if they never had glasses before, or they wanna do something dynamic, or they, you know, they have a brain injury, they forget things, they forget their glasses. So I really love getting people back to where they were pre-injury. That's always my goal. And so for me, it's rehab first. Um, And most people do glasses first. So mine's a little opposite. 
The other thing for that I do is 100% home-based vision therapy. Um, so if you have visual vestibular dysfunction from a concussion, it means that you get dizzy and nause- nauseous or headachey with head and eye movements, which means you're going to hate the car ride. So you're going to get nauseous and dizzy in the car ride, come to my office, I'm going to torture you for an hour, and then I'm going to put you back in the car. And then you get what I call vision therapy hangover. You're going to feel awful for three days, just enough time to come back. And if you have that over time, your brain's going to start to get anxious for the therapy. You're going to get anxious to come to my office because it makes you dizzy and nauseous and you don't want to feel that way. And the brain then gets this Pavlov's dog associated anxiety which then makes all the symptoms worse. And so I found a long time ago that we know you need to provoke symptoms to get it better, but provoking them for a whole hour isn't actually as effective as having the patient do a little bit throughout the day so that they're not over provoking, they can get back to their day. And I always say um, a five to 10 minute window is, is the pearl for me. Anyone can be nauseous for five or 10 minutes, as long as they can reassure themselves it goes away in five to 10 minutes and they can get back to their day. If it lasts longer than that, they're gonna be very hesitant to wanna do rehab. And then I also found, interestingly, because I've obviously had, you know, conversations with the best in our profession, and and Mitch Scheinman and I have had many debates on in-office versus home-based therapy and compliance. Um, And again, his trials were all in developmental peds, which I think rehab different than acquired TBI. They're completely different. Um, But one of the things I'll say is when I did try doing a combination of home-based and in-office, they all stopped doing their home-based treatment, all of them, because they knew they were going to see me in a week in office. So when I stopped all my in-office treatment, all of a sudden my compliance for my home base went up because then they were just coming into my office and I was like, oh, you didn't do it? Like, <laughs> Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> so then why are you wasting my time um, and wasting your time? And it's amazing how the beauty of brain injury is people want to get better. They know what it used to feel like to be normal and they want to get better and they are motivated to do the rehab developmental pediatrics or someone who's had a problem their whole life that doesn't know what it's like to read comfortably, I think they're harder. I think they do really well with in-office therapy because you're teaching the brain new tricks. Mm -hmm. They're not as symptom provoked, so they can tolerate an hour. And um, I think they're very different to rehab in that way. Can you give us some examples of how the at-home therapy goes about? Like, do you just give them, here's a homework assignment? Do Do you have them check in on is there some other product or something they use at home how does that work so for me it depends on what eye movements are the problem um so right so i am very problem focused i'm gonna figure out which eye movement is causing which symptom and for what reason and then what are their goals right because every eye movement does a different task in our life if the patient's goal is reading i'm going to worry about accommodative accommodation and convergence but if their goal is i need to be able to get in a car so i can drive my kids to school well, then I'm going to worry more about saccades, smooth pursuits, and vestibular reflex, right? So it's I'm very goal-oriented of what do you need first back in your life because we can get everything else eventually, but let's start with what you want. And then I start with pencil and paper-based things. So that was the other – I worked with ophthalmology. So um, – when I was at Kaiser, I wanted to do vision therapy and all the ophthalmologists, it took a year before they trusted me um, to know you know, that what I do is evidence-based and sound. And then I approached them and said, I wanna do vision therapy for my brain injury patients. Here's the data, here's my studies I've been working on at Cal. And they said, well, we'll let you do it, but you don't get a budget, you don't get chair time and, and you can't you know, use any equipment. Um, and of course, like again, I'm stubborn and I was like, okay. Um, so I created my own and I just created tasks that you could print out pencil and paper and they could do at home to see if it would work and it worked. And so it was like, you know, if you can do things cheaper and faster, why not? Now there are people who, right, there's gonna be people who have a pre-existing problem and they get a concussion. And those ones usually do need some of the extra equipment, the anti-suppression equipment, because they have other types of things that I also have to rehab. Um, But if it's somebody who had normal BB before, I can rehab them. I think the only thing I really use a lot occasionally are flippers and a Brock string. And that's the thing for me is everyone thinks vision therapy, you have to have this whole center and you have to have all this space. And it's like literally Brock string um, <laughs> is all you need to get these people better. And that's the thing is like more people could easily do what I do um, if they wanted to. Uh, so sounds, sounds like you've got good CE to get. <laughs> <laughs> so with all these treatment options, I'm, I'm curious about prisms and your thoughts mm-hmm. on prisms and your use of prisms. Uh, and I ask that because we learn quite a bit about prisms in school, but then sometimes you'll get a doctor's prescription and you're like, why did they prescribe yoked prisms, for example? Yeah. Uh, and I'd just love to, for you to hear your thoughts on that. 
So there's so many theories on types of prisms. I have prescribed all uh, for different reasons. I'm not set on like you see X, you must prescribe Y. Every person is different on why you're prescribing prism. Um, so the different types of prism. So one is compensatory. So let's say that somebody comes in and they have a large intermittent exotrope and they don't have enough virgences to bring it together. I always say the compensatory prism is to help correct, right? If it's an exo, you're giving base in. If it's an eso, you're giving base out. You're correcting enough to help them compensate for whatever virgences they're missing. Mm -hmm. um, some people need it permanently. Some people just need it a little bit as a crutch until we can do the rehab to get their virgin system strong enough. So everyone's different. Um, palsies do really well with prism um, if they're competent enough for it. Sometimes you have to get creative. I definitely have given multiple lectures on adult diplopia correction with prism. And it's okay to get creative. I do combination prisms where I'll grind pr prism into the whole lens. But let's say they have a six nerve and they get a little bit more double when they look left. Well, you can put a little sliver of Fresnel on the left side so that when they look to the left, they still see single. Um, and so you can get creative with prism in that way and combine them. I don't think people combine enough. Same thing mm -hmm. with a fourth. I do what I call a bifocal Fresnel where I'll put a little bit of base down on the eye that has the palsy. So when they look down at their feet, when they're going downstairs, they don't have double. Uh, mm -hmm. So I love compensatory uh, prism. You can also do yoked prism. So why would we do yoked prism? You can do it for multiple reasons. Uh, and there are a lot of theories on it. So one is prism moves things up or down, left or right, depending on where you put things. And so why would someone need that post brain injury? For me in my practice, sometimes it has to do with their neck. Maybe my neck can't move up, down, left or right. Um, or I, great example, I had a patient who has progressive supranuclear palsy. He literally can't get his eyes down at all. And so I saw him last week. And so we his, one of his complaints is he doesn't like eating because he can't move his eyes down. And so he can't see any of his food. And so he has switched to a diet of sandwiches because he can put the sandwich to his face. Um, and he loves sandwiches. And his wife, was, that was their complaint. It was so funny. And they got in this tiff about if it's healthy to eat sandwiches or not um, for like every meal. <laughs> I've, I've had one patient with progressive supranuclear palsy. And yeah. it, it broke my heart yeah. because it's it's progressive and it just you just never gets better and well and the problem is that people don't recognize the eyes lead the body and so they'll say things like oh we'll just move your head but you can't you actually to move your head you prime moving your head by looking there first and so patients with PSP have a very hard time moving their head down to compensate for the fact that their eyes can't move down because the neck muscles to prime to look down start to turn on when you look down and so you you can do training for them but it's it's almost impossible and so for them i give them yoked prism to move things up so i have a pair of what i'll call for him it was right eating glasses so how far away is our eating distance and then we're going to do yoked prism to move things up for him and then we also do modifications and adaptations to also move things up so it's not as hard but even just three prism diopters yoked that's a good amount of movement up for them to at least use their peripheral vision, keep their eyes in primary gaze, and see their food accurately and, and move it. So yoked can be helpful for restrictive palsies. It can also be helpful for nystagmus. So if my null point and my nystagmus is in a weird gaze, you can move kind of that null point over. So that's really helpful. Um, and then I've also used it a lot for visual field loss. So if somebody has a macular involving hemi field loss and they can't read, so particularly my right hemis have a hard time reading, Yoked prism can actually expand their field a little bit. It's not going to give them 35 degrees or enough to drive, but it'll give them three to five degrees, which is actually enough to give them reading fluidity. And so I find that very helpful for that population as well. What about visual midline shift? Oh, controversial. Yeah, <laughs> I, want hear, um, I want to hear your thoughts. I personally hate the terminology. Um, and the reason for that, number one, is people will colloquially drop the visual and just say midline shift. And midline shift actually is something that can happen in the brain. You can have the brain literally shift over the midline. Um, and so I don't like the term visual midline shift at all. Uh, the other term that's used in replacement, which I do appreciate, is called abnormal egocentric location. So abnormal egocentric location just means where I think I am in space is abnormal. Um, now, why would we have that? So interestingly, in our clinic, we find it's not uncommon in patients who have whiplash injury, and we know that the neck is a very big organ for proprioception and where we are in space. Mm -hmm. And so it's funny because you'll have a patient post-concussion where they abnormally locate where they are in space, and a lot of people can do you know, the test where you follow your finger in front of their face until they say that's in the center, and if it's not in their nose, then it's abnormal. Super subjective, easy to mess that test up. I have problems with that test in so many different ways. 
Um, however, there are some patients where they will tell you the other symptoms that I think are more helpful when they have abnormal egocentric location is I feel the world is tilted. Um, whenever I'm walking somewhere, I feel like things are at an angle or I'm looking at my computer and my computer is at an angle and I give them yoked prism for the egocentric location shift and all of a sudden they tell me it looks correct again. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting, we have a PT in our clinic that works on necks and when she fixes their neck problem, all of a sudden their abnormal egocentric location goes away. Mm -hmm. And that'll happen too where you'll see that's been a criticism of this prism and of this diagnosis is like, well, all these patients have this problem and then they get the prism and then eventually it just goes away. But is it that it goes away or is it the patients in rehab the problem that caused it went away, and now they don't need the prism. Um, I don't think it's so much prism adaptation, which is what people think it is. I think it's actually the thing that caused it went away, and so now we don't need the prism to compensate for it anymore. Thanks for enlightening me on that. <laughs> I have a few patients um, that I kind of co-manage. They, they go to a place that does a lot more on the side of neuro and VT, yeah. and sometimes I'm just like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> like, like <laughs> what, why do you have these like these huge base in prism, base down prisms in both eyes? And and then I usually am this, having to be like, well, I'm going to have you go back to them because <laughs> they know a lot more on that subject than but, I do. Uh, but I, I appreciate that. Well, and everyone does it different. And I've had where people go fly, see some other neurooptometrist in a different state, and they're like, I want the exact same prisms that this guy gave me. And I'm like, well, I'm going to have to call that optical because there's no way. That's the other thing I'll say, pearl wise, for any optometrist listening is. It doesn't matter what you measured in that lensometer. You never know what someone actually prescribed when they're doing yoked prism. Like you don't know if they put in yoked a half or yoked one. Um, and so call, just call and ask, especially if a patient's like, this is the only prism that's ever made me feel good in my life. I'm like, I'm not touching it. I'm just gonna figure out whatever they gave you and I'll give you that. And then make sure you also ask what the pupil distance was. Mm -hmm. Cause that'll be the other thing is sometimes they'll do a funny pupil distance and then you are chasing this optical per patient, trying to get them happy, and it was just because they did a different pupil distance than you did. Yeah, I think that's really important to point out because that's that's an issue we run into with you know people purchasing glasses all over the place. Is where where exactly are they centered? How are they fitting on your face? Because you're looking through a different part of the lens. Uh, I think that just emphasizes that point. Uh, I'm curious how you measure prism. How do you prefer to measure it? Do you use Von Graaff? Do you measure with Maddox rod? Do you just do with loose prisms? How do you how do you do it? Yeah. So measure it or prescribe it. <laughs> Different questions. Both. Okay. <laughs> um, I do everything in free space. So I don't like using a foropter because the foropter itself can induce convergence just by having that something so proximal to your face. And so we know that you are going to under prescribe your basin and it'll also mess with your vertical and so you'll end up over prescribing vertical oftentimes mm -hmm. um so i do everything in free space trial frame refraction honestly by the time people get to me i know their refraction was perfectly nailed down by the previous optometrist like optometrists are amazing at refraction it's just the prism part that they need help with um and so i do everything in free space i use prism bars um, I combine the prism. So what people also have to keep in mind is you have to figure out especially if someone has a diagonal deviation fix the vertical first and then remeasure the horizontal because a lot of patients, the vertical is the barrier to fusion and you fix the vertical and all of a sudden they, right, they had a 20 prism after XT, but actually it was just that little two prism after vertical. You fix the two prism after vertical and all of a sudden the 20 just falls in line. Um, and so I always say fix the vertical first and then measure, once you fix the vertical, measure the vergences horizontally and see how much horizontal you really need to do. So I don't do any of the textbook methods. I think part of that is because I work with adults and adult diplopia does not, people who've had a deviation their whole life are abnormal in how they respond to PRISM. They're never like the textbook. That's why I actually did a residency. My mentor, because I wasn't going to do a residency because there wasn't a TBI residency when I was doing residencies. And my mentor at the time said, you have to at least do a BV residency because nothing will ever look like the textbook. She goes, everything in ocular disease will look like something you can find in a textbook. You'll figure it out. And she's like, BV never looks like the textbook. You just need as many cases as you can under your belt, um, which was the best advice I've ever gotten. I say I like that. That's yeah. really good. What's the worst advice you've ever had? Aside from don't do what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, I would say that's probably it. Like, oh, just give up on your dreams and try contacts. <laughs> So you work in a unique place. Like you have a team of subspecialists all working at once. Yep. What's that like? Amazing. Um, I think all of us elevate each other in different ways that we practice. The 
lunchtime conversations are amazing um, because you learn so much. You'll get fun facts from someone. I think when you have an emergency case, that's where it really like for me is the best moment of my life. Like I've had a patient where they came in and it just seemed off. And and it's one of those things where I I can tell, you know, I think this patient might be having a stroke. And then to just literally walk next door, ask a physician, hey, can you come in? And then he's going to do a more systemic workup than I'm going to do and be like, yeah, I think they're having a stroke. And then both of us then triage that case to be able to do it that quickly for a patient. I also think for mental health, um, you know, sometimes I'll see a patient and they're just in a really bad sp- space and I can tell they're in a bad space and usually in regular healthcare. And again, not all of our patients necessarily see all of us. They can have other providers um, and some people can just see one of us if they want, which is fine. But if I have someone with a mental health problem, for me to get a hold of their primary care, get them into their primary care, get them on a medication if they need it, or get, have I've had to call 5150s a couple times, those are hard. And it's so wonderful to have the patient just stay in that chair and me go next door and be like, can you come and talk to this person about their mental health options and what you want to do for them? And then they literally leave the office with a script um, for either therapy or, you know, it's, it's just so nice to have that expedited. And so many people I've talked to say they work in a multidisciplinary setting and they, they work with an ophthalmologist and, and I'm not putting that down, but I really would love to see primary care really getting integrated with optometry and, and being with like having a pediatric optometrist with a pediatrician or an optometrist with a primary care physician in the same office would just be my dream of multidisciplinary yeah. care. That would be a potent mix <laughs> yeah. for sure. That, uh, that's, that seems like a dream. The, uh, and I love the fact that you mentioned like mental health and just how quick and easy it can be for these. Cause these are not a lot of patients who've had head injury, concussion, something going on neurologically. Like they have a tough time just getting to your office, right? Yeah. They usually need a ride or they're having a tough day, whether it be they woke up in a bad mood that day, they have a bad migraine, you know, every, I think every optometrist has had that where they've just had a patient who's struggling. And the fact that you guys are able to help address all of those things so quickly at once in like a team effort. Or get a second opinion. Like the number of times our physical therapists and are like, do you think this patient's a little depressed? Like, do you think so? Because sometimes you can't tell, right? And it's nice to have a second person be like, yeah, I think so. And then we'll go team up on our physician. (laughs) So what about the doctors who don't have access to these teams? Yeah. Uh, What sort of advice would you be able to give to them especially when it comes to this like hey if somebody's having these vague complaints maybe the doctor's having the thoughts that you know maybe they've had a head injury maybe they know they were in a car accident what tests would you say that any doctor should be able to do to at least lead them down the path of hey is this something that we can start to manage now or is this something we can identify and at least hand off to a subspecialist yeah uh, one would be the, look at what's the most common thing that's going to happen. So of traumatic brain injury, 90% of them is going to be mild. Um, and so of mild traumatic brain injury, the eye health exam is going to be normal 85% of the time. So you should expect a normal eye exam. My first counsel is don't tell the patient that they're normal if they have a complaint. Just reassure them that the eye health is normal. Because a lot of patients feel not heard when they come in and they say it's blurry and it's double. And you're like, well, I checked and you look good. And then they feel like they're making it up. Um, so number one is eye health should be normal. Do check for dry eye. Um, neurologically, more patients with concussion have dry eye than the general population. So that's a low hanging fruit that everybody can treat and diagnose. Um, and then asking really good questions can be helpful. Is it blurry? Is it double? What symptoms do you get with certain tasks? Cause we know even if you don't, aren't good at doing an eye movement exam, I know that scrolling on a phone is smooth pursuits. I know that me looking at two screens and reading is cicades. I know that double vision is probably convergence insufficiency, right? So it's, <laughs> those are just easy things. You didn't even have to test for it. You just had to ask them what gives them their symptoms, when do they notice it, at what distance. And then common things being common, the most common thing that patients are going to have is accommodative disorders. Everyone's so big on convergence. But actually, if you look at the data, it's accommodation that goes down first. And a lot of times, um, this will throw people off because you'll have an NPC of 45 centimeters, something huge, but they're aligned, right? They're, there's no exo. So it's not the classic CITT pattern of a CI. And the reason is because it's a pseudo CI. It's actually, I have trouble converging because I have trouble accommodating. And you fix the accommodation with a monocular near far chart or a monocular push up, 
and then all of a sudden their convergence is better and you didn't have to do any convergence training at all. So monocular NPA, um, binocular NPC, do them three to five times. Um, so I'm actually doing a study right now with New Jersey Institute of Technology and we're looking at how long do you actually have to do eye movement testing to elicit symptoms in these patients. And we're doing right now a minute for every eye movement, which is incredibly laborious. But we're finding a lot of patients don't have symptoms until they're about 30 seconds, 45 seconds in. And so a lot of times what's happening is you're just not testing cicades long enough to realize that they have a problem with cicades. And so my big thing is if you're going to check for cicades, go for 30 to 45 seconds and see if they get symptoms with it. Because if you're just going for 5 to 10 seconds, you're going to miss it. And then say that they're fine, but they're not fine. I say I have to admit, like, that takes that takes a lot of sharecare, oh, right? Oh, so much time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's still important for your patient, but we know it takes time. And I, to admit, I I never done testing that long. Yeah. You know, unless somebody's breaking down within the first within the first ten seconds. Yeah. But that's that's pretty that's good advice. I appreciate that. I think the best advice I got once, or at least reassurance, um, was double vision is not a twenty minute complaint. And that was actually from a neuro ophthalmologist. And he was like, I hate, because it was more just him complaining. He's he looking at his schedule and he had all these 20 minute slots for double vision. And he was like, why do they do this to me? It's not a 20 minute complaint. And I was like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm, it's nice to know that you who are the top of double vision also feels like it takes a while right. to figure out what it is. Unless it's really just ghosting from un uncorrected Unless it's like <laughs> secretly just keratoconus. Yeah. <laughs> Even that though, uh, in my experience, so I my residency had a sliver of TBI in it, and I, I a lot of it was triaging double vision, um, yeah. because in in the VA I was at the ophthalmology department, same thing, did not want to touch double vision. So I got, and then my mentors were like, "Well, have fun with that, <laughs> uh, you know, trial by fire sort of thing," and I eventually had to get good with it, and. Still, at least it, it gave me a good skill set. So at the clinic now, when there are patients who've got double vision, it's like, I I know how to do it. And of course, I have my students now figure it out, <laughs> try to teach them how to do it. So you also did trial by fire for them too? <laughs> Basically, yeah. But with some more guide, maybe some more guided help and tips on it. That's all very helpful information. Uh, I think a lot of doctors out there, we know how important eyes are and the brain communication with the eyes and that coordination, but it's challenging with the natural way of, of most clinics to find time for that. Yep. How about um, establishing a referral communication? I imagine you get referrals from other local ODs mm -hmm. uh, and MDs and maybe other professionals how do you think, is there, is there a best way to communicate and establish that partnership? Yeah. And you had said this kind of previously also in the fact that a lot of people don't have a clinic like I have. Mm -hmm. And the way that I have always felt you can create a good network is communication. In optometry, we often only write a letter to the primary care physician when something's wrong or we need something. And one of the pearls I learned early on in my career is to send a letter every single time. Um, hey, I saw your patient and they looked great. Hey, I saw your patient. They're not great. And what I learned was kind of bottom line up front. I saw them. This was the problem. This is how I'm fixing it. And I'll keep you updated. You don't need to write this long winded approach and give them, you know, a 20 page report. What physician has time to read that? No one. Um, and they're not going to if they if they're interested, they'll call you. That's what I learned as well. Um, I've had some physicians or pediatricians who are, will just ask me over for a lunch and learn and be like, tell me about convergence insufficiency. Um, but most of the time I just say, hey, uh, your patient complained of double vision. They have convergence insufficiency. I started them on rehab. I'll see them again in six weeks. Um, and that's short, sweet. I attach my note. But one of the things I learned from physicians is they have no idea how to read eye notes at all. Like the first question I always get is, what does OD mean? Um, and I'm like, oh, right, uh, right eye, and then, uh, 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 OS is left eye. And, but if a physician, you like, we don't think about that, right? Yeah. But like the number of acronyms we use, it's my sister-in-law's a uh, physician and she's a surgeon. She's like, oh, eye notes are gobbledygook. She's like, I can't read those things. Um, which helps me realize like why spend all the time, right? If they're not going to read it anyways, because they can't understand OD and OS, I'll just give them what they need to know, which is the very minimal. Um, and then the more that you work with people for your referral network, I think that's by giving them those reports over and over again, by letting them see that you're getting people better is helpful. That'll help drive more referrals to you. And then keeping people in the loop. I think 
this is my personal opinion when it comes to subspecialization in optometry. You can't be good at everything. And, and I see these practices where, you know, I do neuro and I do VT and I do myopia control and I do sclerals and I do dry eye. And, I, and I'm like, you better have 5,000 different employees doing all those things. And then you open it up, it's like two doctors. And, and I, my problem with that is it's impossible to be good at all those things because all of those things take so much time and energy and dedication. And so for me, I think what makes my referrals so, so successful is and why ODs send to me, which is hard. ODs to OD transfer is hard is because I don't have an optical and I don't do contact lens. And so if, let's say, a patient comes into my office, and, and when I moved to Richmond, one of the optometrists had asked, like, so if I have a patient and you see them and you notice their contact lenses are off, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to call you and say, hey, their contact's off. Can you just up their prescription for six months while I'm seeing them? Um, and then the reason for that is if I, is it easier for me to just write the script for the contact lens? Yes. But the problem is when that script turns up for renewal, they're going to come back to me. And I don't want that. I don't want to steal that referral. So the extra step to say, hey, I don't do contacts. I'm going to contact your doctor for you and have that relationship with that doctor so that it's not laborious for the patient. If the patient then has to go all the way back to get, you know, just like an extra quarter, that's not helpful for the patient care. But if they just renew it for three to six months while I'm treating them, and then once I finish treating them, they go back to their primary care, it's seamless. Nobody's worried I'm stealing their patients. And I even tell the patients, I don't take lifers. You're not allowed to see me for life. Um, and that, that's, I think, what, what builds a good referral center. I like that. I think that's really smart. And I've heard a lot of other people um, in the, on the podcast recently saying how important ODOD referrals really are. Uh, so we've covered a lot of different things, and I imagine we could keep going. But uh, to kind of close out the podcast, one of my favorite questions to ask, if you were, if you were elected tomorrow as like the Surgeon General of Optometry, <laughs> that optometry is now going to have such an important role in our healthcare system, what decision would you make first? Whether it be for the profession, some, some change you would like to see better made better for the profession, or for even public health, what would you want to do? I think access, accessibility to care would be, mm-hmm. I would want to create a way that, I, I hate the excuse of, I can't do vision therapy, there's no one in my area. I can't do this service for this patient. There's no one in my area. So for me, it would be how can we make sure that everybody gets access to the best care, to the best providers, and we work together as a network and we stop working in these little silos um, the way we currently are. I think for the benefit of the patient, the more that we can work as a team of optometrists and really highlight everyone's skill, I think it'll benefit everyone. Um, I think the other thing that I'm very passionate about is access to care for kids. Um, there's a lot of issues with getting kids and vision bills out there because we all know we don't have the ability necessarily if we mandated an eye exam to tomorrow for every kid. Not everyone's good at working with kids. Not every eye provider will see a kid. Um, and there's a lot of is- issues with kids and reading um, and all they needed was a pair of glasses. Um, and then the final thing, and this is actually my own kind of special project, is looking at kids in foster systems Um, and there's a lot of issues with getting them glasses. Um, So that would be a big public health push for me, would be making sure that we have access to glasses for people who can't afford them and recognizing that sometimes, particularly kids, break or lose their glasses within a year. And what do we do if they break that one pair that they had a voucher for? How do we just get them another voucher? And, And particularly with foster homes, kids get picked up within an hour and they misplace their glasses, but then they go to their new home they don't have access to care again. So it's that big access to care issue. Mm-hmm. That would be the first thing I'd want to fix. Those are all uh, great things. I love all of those. So, Well, Jackie, thank you so much for being a guest on the podcast. Hopefully, again, I know you have so much more you can share. So hopefully we'll have you back on as a guest in the future. So again, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So that was our episode for today. Thank you so much for listening in. Hey, you know, I put a lot of effort into these episodes and I really want to continue bringing the most value to you and our listeners. So if you haven't done so already, please, if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. Or if you're listening in on your favorite podcasting station, leave us a review over there. That'll really help us out. Thank you so much again for listening in and keep an eye on it and we'll see you in that next episode.